By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today I am playing a match against Chad. And Chad, you're new to the channel. Welcome here on Timmy Talks. Uh, Chad is a player from the United States. He's a member of the Northern Paladins. And he's brought a Zoo Genon deck to the table. It's kind of a mix between Urnum Genon and a Zoo deck. And in the deck deck, I'll show you all about it. And I'm playing against Chat with a brand new brew of mine. I've called it Fish Liver Poison. And um, yeah, it's a Merfolk deck with Fish Liver Oil and of course Merfolk Assassin together. They're brewing poison. But before uh, we go there, I would just like to point out the rule set of today. We're playing according to the Paladin Magic rules. Uh, and that means that you're allowed to play with Fallen Empires, Mana Burn is a thing, and they also have their own restricted and actually a banned list as well. And there's a picture here coming up, I'll show it on the screen. As you can see, Mind Twist is banned, Library of Alexandria is banned, Strip Mine is banned, and we have some restrictions here as well. Mishra's Factory, Mishra's Workshop, the Tabernacle at Pendrel Vale, and the Maze of If, so they're all restricted. So there are some slight differences. You're also allowed to play with the promotional cards in this format. Now, if you'd like to know more about the Northern Paladin Magic community and these rule sets, simply check the description below and there you will find uh, a link to their lovely webpage and there you can find all the information. They're a really nice community. Um, one other big thing that's uh, different with their rule set is you are allowed to play with proxies. So there are some specific rules with the proxies, but you are allowed to play with them if you want to, of course. Um, so that's uh, as far as I'm gonna go talking about the rule set here uh, in this video. Um, I would also like to point out before I start with the deck deck that as always, you can skip the deck deck by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those stamps reads MTG Games. Click on MTG Games. That takes you straight to the actual gameplay action and as for now i'm going to start uh with the deck deck and i'm going to start with the deck of chad zoo geddon let's take a look and here we see the deck of chad zoo geddon and it looks very much like your traditional earn and geddon deck um you know just for the people that are not familiar with the deck what it wants to do is it wants to play out a big threat as early as possible now when we look at the creatures here of chad he's got a lot of big threats he's got three sarah angels four earn gins and two really cool Darylors. It's really sweet that you've splashed Darylors in here. I'm really looking forward to play against those creatures. I think they're beautiful and I think they're actually very good. They're your only black cards in this deck together with your Demonic Tutor. So I think in this deck, it actually fits really well. So um, what Chet wants to do, right, is play the Mox and Lana Riles, all those mana accelerators as fast as he can to try to play out an Urnum Jinn or a Sarah Angel as early as turn two or turn three. Now, as soon as a big creature is on the battlefield, they want to cast their Armageddon. After the Armageddon, both players don't have any lands, and the idea is because then your opponent doesn't have any lands to cast anything to block your big creature or to take care of your big creature, you're going to win the game because you're swinging in with your 4-4 Sarah Angel and your opponent has nothing to show for, or maybe just a small 1-1. One, one. So that's basically the idea of the deck. Now, important, of course, with a deck like this is that you can also take care of the artifact mana of your opponent and, of course, of maybe some mana dorks that your opponent might be using. So it's really nice to see Chad playing with two disenchants and two dust to dusts. Now, dust to dust is a card you don't see that often, probably because it's a sorcery and it needs two targets. But if it can find two targets, it's instant card advantage, right? Two white and one card from the dark sorcery. And it says removes two artifacts from the game, right? So it's pretty powerful. So if your opponent has, for example, a Mox and a Soul Ring, it's a great way to take care of those uh, of those uh, mana sources of your opponent. And because you also play with Armageddon, you can use the Armageddon to get rid of the lands and your Dust to Dust to get rid of any mana rocks. And then, of course, there are some mana dorks that occasionally you will encounter, especially Birds of Paradise uh, being a very popular one. And therefore, Chet is playing with four Swords to Plowseers. The nice thing about Swords to Plowseers is they're only one white to cast. So even after an Armageddon, chances are that you'll find some mana or still have some artifact mana uh, laying around and you can still cast your swords to plows here. So that's a very, um, you know, strong strategy. This deck is full of answers. It also has the blue power. 
I mean, this is a good deck chat. I'm looking forward to, uh, to play against it. There's one thing that I've uh, noticed while playing against it, especially now seeing your list, um, is that you're playing with four Savannah Lions and only two Lunar Elves and no Birds of Paradise. You did you did tell me a little bit that you felt that you, you don't need uh, Birds of Paradise because you're... Um, you have enough mana, your your kind of your mana color plan is working out. So first off, that's great. So then I would definitely play with Lunar Elves. If if you feel comfortable enough with um you know the, the, the colors that you have in your mana base, you know, if that's uh, sufficient, then I would choose Lunar Elves over Birds of Paradise because then they just become a mana ramp spell, right? So I think that's a good decision. Um when I'm looking at this I would consider adding two more Lunar Elves and maybe taking two Savannah Lions out. Then again, I'm not the one that's been playing this deck and tweaking this deck, but uh, I would love to hear from you, chat, when you're watching this video, uh, why you've decided to put four Savannah Lions in and two Lunar Elves instead of two Savannah Lions and four Lunar Elves, because I'm sure you have your reasons. Of course, Savannah Lions is a very good creature, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, that's just something I would do because I feel that Lunar Elves works so well in a uh, tempo strategy and in a strategy with Armageddon, right? Because Lunar Elves will enable you to play Armageddon a turn early. It will enable you to play uh, Urn of Jinn a turn early, uh, Sarah Angel a turn early, right? So it can be very valuable for you. And also after the Armageddon resolves, you still keep your Lunar, so you still have green mana to cast creatures or artifacts or whatever. So yeah, I think just looking at this, that's the only question mark that I have when, when I'm looking at this list. Anyway, uh, this is the deck of Chet. Very nice, looks very powerful. And now let's take a look at my deck. And here we see my deck, Fish, Liver, Poison. And uh, this deck started with my plan of wanting to play with Merfolk Assassin and Fish, Liver, Oil. It's just the synergy between these two cards is so incredibly obvious and yet nobody plays with it also for obvious reasons because, you know, um, you need two cards just to destroy one creature and there are simply better options. Then again, you know, in blue, a way to destroy creatures is actually pretty good because blue is good in countering stuff, bouncing stuff, but not so good in really killing stuff. So just having something to destroy creatures, kind of like an icy royal assassin machine, it's pretty nice. Now, obviously, um, this is not that strong, right? It, it, it is a bit quirky, but I really like it and I love the whole flavor idea that you're saying here's some fish liver oil so that you can have island walk, but actually the fish liver oil is poison and it will kill the creature that you give it to because of that merfolk assassin combination. So for people that don't know, merfolk assassin, two blue, creature from the dark, a one, two merfolk, you can tap it to destroy target creature with Island Walk and Fish Liver Oil, an enchant creature from Arabian Nights, one blue and one to cast, and it gives target creature Island Walk. So it's as simple as that. So I'm going to cast a, a Fish Liver Oil on a creature of my opponent. That creature gains Island Walk, and then I'm going to tap my Merfolk Assassin to kill that creature, right? Now, the, the flaw of this strategy is that in that process, I will lose my fish liver oil. So my fish liver oil will go into my graveyard. Now, in order to get it back, I'm playing with a skull of arm. Now, I'm only playing with one because the skull is just not that good. And I only want it mid game, late game because skull of arm is three to cast an artifact from the dark. So that's actually pretty reasonable. But then it's five and tap to return target enchantment from my graveyard to my hand. So it's five and tap and that five mana is so steep. So I've tried playing with two in this deck, but I felt then that I would draw into the skull too early. So I'm not just playing with one, that if I need it late game, I can still kind of get it back. Now, besides this plan with the Merfolk Assassin, it is also, of course, a fish deck, meaning there are also Lord of Atlantises in this deck and there's an island walk strategy, right? I'm playing with Phantasmal Terrains, four of them in total in Enchant Land. So I can cast my Phantasmal Terrains to give my opponent an island. All my creatures will probably have Island Walk, so I'm playing with four Lord of Atlantis. It's a 2-2 creature that gives all other merfolks plus one, plus one, an Island Walk. And when you have multiple Lord of Atlantises in the game, they also give each other plus one, plus one, an Island Walk, because they're a summon lord, but also a summon merfolk. That's their creature type. So um, there is this Island Walk strategy in this deck. Now, there are a couple of tricks. First off, it is mono blue but there are no counter spells. 
And I always love, well, always, but when I do that, I'm like, ah, oh, it's really cool because people expect you to counter. So you leave two blue open actually to just play my boomerang, but people think, oh, he's keeping two blue open. He's got to have a counter spell. And they just pass turn waiting for the right moment. Uh, I always find it kind of funny. So actually I shouldn't show this deck picture to you because now you know, oh, he's playing with this deck. He actually doesn't play with a counter spell. So, uh, but just imagine you're playing with this at a tournament, your opponent doesn't know what you're playing. Obviously they see mono blue and they're gonna think counter magic. So they're gonna be very aware of possible counter spells the whole match and you don't have any. The funny thing is uh, in this deck, there are four boomerangs and boomerang two blue to cast uh, and it says return target permanent to its owner's hand. I just find this card very, very versatile. So, I mean, you can even use this as a tempo uh, a play. What I love to do if I have the opportunity is if my opponent just drops a land, has seven cards in hand still, passes the turn, then in their end step, I love to use my boomerang to boomerang a land back to their hand and kind of force them then to discard a card. And also they're going down with one land drop. So then it's almost like a time walk effect. So it's, it's really cool. If you use this card the right way, it's actually quite strong. Another way of using it, it is to protect what you have. If your opponent will try to disenchant, disenchant some of your enchantments, you can use boomerang on your enchantment, get it back. You know, you can use it to protect your control magic. You can also, of course also use it to protect your creatures, to even to protect the land if you want to. Like boomerang is very, very versatile. And in that way, it kind of works as a counter spell. Of course, not as good because you get the, the permanent back into your hand and you have to recast it again. So it's not as good as a counter spell but it comes pretty close and you can also use it in different ways. Now, the main reason why it's in this deck is the synergy it has with Dance of Many. Now, Dance of Many is an enchantment from the dark, two blue to cast, and when it comes into play, it targets a creature in play and it makes a token copy. So it's kind of like a clone, right? But then it makes a token copy. Now, during your upkeep, you have to pay two uh, to keep the Dance of Many around. Now, as soon as the Dance of Many is destroyed or the token is destroyed, uh, the, the dance of many goes and the token goes, right? So if one, one or the other dies, you know, the enchantment goes, the creature goes, they all go. They, they go away from the table. Now there is a little trick, right? What you can do is you can cast your dance of many and then while the token copy is still on the stack, you can play boomerang, return the dance of many to your hand and um, then the token copy resolves. And that means that the token copy is no longer linked to the Dance of Many. So it's just a token on the battlefield. And then you don't have to pay the two blue upkeep cost. And also the token is no longer as vulnerable because it's not connected with the Dance of Many. And then of course, a turn after you can cast that Dance of Many again and you can make another copy. And obviously what I wanna copy with this deck is the Lord of Atlantis. So I just wanna keep copying and copying and copying. I'm playing three Dance of Many's two clones, so I can just make a huge, uh, huge army of Lord of Atlantis. I'm also playing with a Vesuvian double ganger, so I can also copy that. So that's definitely one of the tricks. Then I'm also playing with two control magics. Again, I can protect the control magics uh, with my boomerang and even with my time elemental if I have enough mana uh, to kind of keep it around and steal the right creatures from my opponent, clone the right creatures from my opponent. So in that way, um, even if I would play with counter spells, I don't want to counter creature threats because I have other like ways to deal with creatures with this deck. Um, now there is also power in this deck and you may notice that the cards look a little different. Now this is a special proxy set because we're playing Paladin Magic uh, this evening and we're allowed to use proxy. So I've decided because of that specific rule set to I think for the first time ever play with proxies and I decided to play with these three proxies because they have a special meaning uh, to me. They were sent by my friends, the Desert Twisters over in Arizona. And uh, if you want to know more about this specific proxy set and the cost that is supported by buying these, uh, have a look in the, uh, in the movie, the video I made about it right here on YouTube. There's probably an info card popping up right now. So maybe you want to check that out. Maybe you want to check that out later. It's, it's quite a nice video and it's really a beautiful a proxy set, it's inspired by the early test cards uh, of Magic the Gathering when the game was still in development. Okay, so uh, this is my deck. As you can see, it doesn't have a sideboard, by the way. This is a best of five match and we're not playing with any sideboards. So maybe that's, that's good to mention. I don't think I've mentioned that in the introduction. So uh, this is my deck. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And now let's go to the games.
Game number one of this best of five, Paladin Magic. I'm sitting on the right there with the Timmy playmat passing turn here. We see Chat who's playing with a double playmat. And just for your information, unfortunately, Chat broke his arm, his right arm. So he's playing with his left hand only. So that's why you're seeing him like doing everything with that hand and stuff. Uh, he's casting a lot of rails, by the way, turn one with the City of Brass. And I'm playing a Phantasmal Terrain, turning that into an island and passing turn. So he's got some ramp going on, playing a plane. So he's got a planes, an island, and a green mana source with the Llanowar. Okay, there's an extra one. Look at that. So he's really ramping up and playing a Savannah Alliance and attacking me with the one Llanowar. So I'm going to drop here to 19. So early pressure here from chat. And I really need at least a creature to block. Let's see what I can do. Tapping two blue, playing another Phantasmal Terrain, targeting... His planes turning that into an island as well. And it looks like Chad wants to respond. So in response, he's going to tap his planes for white and a colorless. And he takes off a life point. I don't think he has to because it's now just a basic island. Okay, yeah, exactly. So he turns it back and he plays a disenchant. And he does that on a phantasmal terrain that's on the city of brass. Makes sense. And he can make every color of mana again. Untapping everything here. And he can attack me for three. He's going to attack me for two. So I'm expecting him to play a creature here. Maybe an Urn of Jinn. So I'm taking more damage. Tapping four. Taking one hit from his own city. Oh, the Darylor. That is pretty cool. So Darylor, one black and three. A 4-4 four, four creature from the Fallen Empires. And it reads, all your black creatures or all your black spells now cost an extra black to cast. In the meanwhile, I'm playing some creatures out here. Lord of Atlantis together with a merfolk assassin so the lord pumps the merfolk assassin it's now a two three so at least that allows me to block the savannah alliance and probably only take the damage from the darylor if he chooses to attack of course i could double block as well it's quite risky then because if chat has a sword supply series i'm really toast so i'm deciding not to do it going down to 13 Ooh, he's tapping more taking a damage will we see sarah angel yes yeah, sarah angel five mana you kind of know What's coming? So it's looking very bad for me. I need a fish liver oil or a control magic. And yeah, yeah, not a time elemental. Although time elemental can start being useful starting next turn, but it's an O2 creature from Legends. If you block or attack with it, it destroys itself. You get five damage. So that's not really an option. The cool thing about the card is though, you can pay two blue and two and tap it to return any permanent to their owner's hand. But it's pretty steep, right? You gotta pay four and you gotta tap it. So starting next turn, I can start using it, but it's gonna eat up most of my mana. Okay, and here's an attack by the Darylor and the Sarah. Obviously the Sarah doesn't need to tap, but I guess he's just doing it to make it clear. So now I'm double blocking, kind of feeling forced because of the Sarah, hoping that he doesn't have a Swords or a Giant Grove. It looks like he doesn't uh, or doesn't want to use it. So now he can choose what he wants to kill. He's gonna kill the Merfolk Assassin. And he's going to leave the Lord of Atlantis on the board. And I'm going to go down to nine here, taking the damage from the Sarah Angel. And here he's taking more damage from his own City of Brasses. I believe he's now on. It's kind of hard to see. It looks like 14. Another Sarah Angel. Oh, man. Of course, I can use my Time Elemental to send one of the Sarah Angels back. Finding more lands, which is not too bad because I need four mana for the Time Elemental. So maybe I've got a Boomerang in hand as well. Could be. But it's not looking good for me. I'm not really able. I haven't had a moment in this game where I could, you know, take take a, a breather. It's been just constant pressure. And using my elemental here to send back the Sarah, blocking the uh, Savannah Lines so trading it for my Lord and taking the damage from the Angel. Going to go down to nine. And uh, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm sorry, going to go down from nine to five, I mean. And this is not great here. I mean, my chances of winning this are, are close to none. Of course, he's going to recast his Sarah Angel now. Going to go down to 13. So next turn, I'm actually dead next turn because he can attack me with the Llanowar. Uh, playing an island again. Oh, I just need, for instance, a clone or a control magic. Could have could have bought me some time, but it's not going to happen. And remember, I cannot block with the time elemental because if I block with it, I get five damage. So I cannot use my time elemental to block the Llanowar and then tap and send uh, Sarah Angel back. So I'm taking five damage. That's it. Only had a Gem Day Tome in hand. 
which is not very useful next to that time element. Okay, so this was game one. Well done, chat. A lot of pressure from you. Hopefully, uh, I'll be more lucky in, uh, in, in game two because I need to control the game a little bit more because your deck is simply going too fast, at least in this game number one. So let's shuffle up and we'll catch back up with this in game number two. Game number two, and here we go. Now remember, it is a best of five, so hopefully I have a little bit, a bit of a quicker start and chat has a slower start. That would be ideal. Maybe no mana dorks, that would be kind of nice. So no Lanarer, no, uh, no Mox turn one. He does have a turn one play. It's a Savannah Alliance. It's not great, but at least it's not a mana accelerator. And, oh, look at this. This is one of the altars. So this is the Ancestral Recall Altar. So you're probably thinking, what card is that? Well, it's uh, it's one of the altars I get sent by uh, the Desert Twisters. And if you want to know more about that, um, you can find a link in the description below to that specific video. And now I've cast a Lord of Atlantis, a 2-2, two -two, that gives all merfolk plus one plus one, all other merfolk, an island walk. So at least I've got a creature on the board. I'm probably not going to trade it for the Savannah Alliance. So exactly, just going to take the damage here. We're going to go to 18. Chat also has cast a Tundra in his past turn. Okay, so he's going a little bit slower than at game number one. So maybe he's kind of offering me an opening, attacking him for two now. He's going to drop to 18 and casting, oh, a time walk. Wow, really finding the power. In response, he casts an Ancestral Recall. So uh, we're really showing those power pieces. But uh, this is, of course, great that uh, I'm able to find the power, but chat playing that Ancestral Recall, drawing three here, and uh, then saying, okay, your time walk resolves. So now I'm taking my extra turn, finding an island, four mana. Can I cast something with that? Can I do something? Looking at my hand here, it looks like I'm not very happy swinging my arm there. A little bit in the tank. Um, I'm thinking maybe I have a Merfolk Assassin. That would actually be quite nice because it's a 1-2 and because of the pump from the Lord of Atlantis, it would become a 2-3 creature. So that will be kind of nice. What am I going to do? You're tapping 2. Okay, there's the Dance of Many. So it's going to make a copy of the Lord of Atlantis and now I play a Boomerang. So this is the trick I talked about in the deck tech section. So you can stack it in a way that the token is still on the stack and in response you play the boomerang on the Dance of Many, bring it back to your hand. That way you do get the token, but you no longer have the Dance of Many in play, so there's no connection between the two. So that means my Lord of Atlantises are now both three threes with Island Walk. And as you can see, uh, my opponent Chad has that Tundra on the battlefield, so he does have an island as well. So they're basically unblockable and things are really looking up for me. Chat only finding a Mox Jet, not a land, it seems. And he's playing a Time Walk. Okay, taking an extra turn. So at least that's something. Finding a land, four lands down. Four is kind of the magic number. There we see Darylore. Oh, that is sweet. A 4-4. Four, four. One and three from Fallen Empires. And now we see both Lord of Atlantis is here having Island Walk pumping each other. So two, three, three. So potentially I can deal six damage. And I believe it looks like chat is on is at 15. It's kind of hard to see with the dice. Tapping four here. Am I going to cast Control Magic? Am I going to take his Daryl Lord? That would be brutal. Yeah. Oh, a clone. Okay. So I'm cloning Lord of Atlantis. I wanted to say, yeah, I'm taking the Daryl Lord, but I'm not doing that. I'm cloning instead. That means my Lord of Atlantis are now 4-4 four, four each. I'm swinging for 8 damage. Wow, so that means Chad's going to drop from 15 to 7. Exactly, he's on 7 life. And next turn I can finish it because of that Tundra and that basic island. Remember, my Lord of Atlantis have island walk. That is the problem. He needs to find a couple of swords here at least. Actually, one sorts will do it, because then it can only deal six damage. At least it buys him a turn. I would definitely swing in with the Darylor here. Why not? It's He can't block with it anyway. And it looks like he's tapping the Savannah. No, untapping it again. He's a little bit in the tank here, trying to find a way out. He knows if he doesn't do anything, he's going to die. 
There is a regrowth. Okay, so now he can choose between a time walk or an ancestral recall. Bring him back the time walk. That is interesting. So he can attack me now. Maybe, I mean, if he has like a source or something. Playing a time walk, taking his extra turn. And now he needs to find something useful. I'm on 14, by the way. Didn't block the Daryl Lore, of course. And now he's attacking with both. Now I'm deciding, I think I'm deciding not to block the Savannah Lines uh, because if I block it and he has a balance in hand, it will only make his balance stronger and I can just take the damage. Or if I block it and for example, he has a giant growth, it's also a problem for me. So I'm just taking that extra two damage. I'm taking six in total and I'm now on eight, which is still more than enough. Because next turn I can still kill Chad if I can keep my three Lord of Atlantis. That is a big if though. Because he's been drawing a lot of cards. Going through his hand again. Are we going to get a 1-1 here? And there's a Sylvan that's not going to do it for him. But looks like I can win this one. Oh, making even another Lord of Atlantis. So now the Lord of Atlantis is give each other plus three, plus three. Another one. <laughs> okay. I've got five Lord of Atlantis. Man. Oh, swimming all over him. And uh, sorry, chat, that was kind of brutal. You couldn't find any way to contain these Lord of Atlantis. There's no sorts of plowsters in a game for you. And I think that was uh, one of the problems. And of course, I got those two power pieces. That really, really helped. So, wow, this was a really cool game number two, from my perspective, at least. And that means it's now 1-1. We're going to shuffle up and we'll catch back up with you in game number three. Game number three. Here we go. 1-1. A -one. So a 1-1 one, one here. Remember, this is a best of five. So this game will not be the end of it. We're playing to whoever gets three games in the pocket first. And Chet is on the play after losing in game number two. And I think that's a huge advantage for him since his deck already has some tempo plays. And ooh, look at that. Another proxy card there, a Mox Sapphire. So I've got two blue. Unfortunately for me, no Lord of Atlantis turn one. That's kind of the dream then. Or a Merfolk Assassin. We haven't seen a lot of Merfolk Assassins, by the way, or Fish Liver Oil. So let's hope that's gonna, gonna come in the upcoming games still. And here is the Lord of Atlantis 2-2. Two, two, and a quick response. I'm already putting my Lord, not even in the grave because it's removed from the game. It's a quick source by chat. And I think that's a very wise decision. And there is another island for me here. Four islands. Let's see what I can do with that. Tapping all four of them. And casting a War Barge. So War Barge is pretty cool. It's a card from the Dark, an artifact. And I believe for three, you can give target creature Island Walk. And of course, that works really well with my uh, Merfolk Assassin. Another nice thing about it is it says if War Barge leaves play, the creature with Island Walk is destroyed. So what I can do as well is I can use my War Barge to give something Island Walk, then play my Boomerang on my War Barge. And that way I can kill a creature as well. Ooh, dust to dust here. That is brutal. What a great answer from Chad. Taking care of two artifacts at once. And I'm finding my time walk again. So taking an extra turn. It is kind of odd to see those proxies, by the way. Um, and then taking my extra turn, playing a Lord of Atlantis, missing a land drop here. So maybe removing that Mox Sapphire was pretty a pretty good move by Chad. We'll just have to see. I mean, it's always nice for me to keep two blue open, not to counter as my opponent is expecting, but actually to uh, to play a boomerang, for example, when they play a Psyblast on your creature, like what Chad is doing right now. It would be great if in response to the Psyblast, of course, I could cast a boomerang, because that way he is taking two damage, but I'm not losing a creature. Now we see Chad playing a Mox Sapphire of his own and passing turn, so now I've got four, tapping all four here, playing a Jam Daytome and passing turn. So maybe that Tome can kind of get me back in it, give me, allow me to draw some cards. At least there's no early pressure from Chet. We saw that in the earlier games, but there's no Savannah line or there's no quick 4-4 creature or anything on the table. So that's kind of nice for me. He does have a lot of lands though. And another Dust to Dust. Oh man. Destroying his own Mox Sapphire, but also more importantly, of course, my Jam Day Tome and casting an Urnum Jin. That is a big problem. Hopefully this is a control magic. Yes, it's a control magic taking over. 
his Urnum Jin, and now let's hope again. I'm constantly hoping that Chet doesn't find a disenchant. He only has two cards in hand, though. So, and remember, he only plays two main board because he also plays two dust to dusts. And we've played this match without sideboarding, by the way. I don't know if I've mentioned that already, but we played this without sideboarding. So we just kept the decks as is. And there we see Chet casting a Lana War Elves and passing turn to me. So that Lana War is going to get Forest Walk. Doesn't really matter that much. And I'm probably going to swing in here. Or... Oh, playing a Fish Liver Oil <laughs> over the Urnum. Giving it Island Walk means it's unblockable. So this is, I mean, this is a bit of a risky move, I guess. But then again, I mean, when you have a fish liver oil in hand, you want to play it out. It's just too good. It's too good not to. So now I've got a creature of my opponent. I gave it Island Walk, and I'm kind of killing him with it. I mean, that is pretty cool. And uh, he's playing another Lanover Elves. I believe we were talking, by the way, about the casting cost difference in Arabian Nights. You've got two versions, the light casting cost symbol and the dark casting cost symbol. The lighter symbol is worth more money, if you're interested in that. There is a Japanese, I believe that's a Japanese Urnum. Really cool. And he's passing turn here. I'm going to give the Urnum Forest Walk. Going to attack. And he's on nine, I believe. And I'm casting a Lord of Atlantis. At least the Lords are kind of going to stop Chat from attacking with the Lunar Elves, which could be important. I wonder what he's going to do. Maybe he's just going to attack anyway. Let's see. And now my Urnum gets uh, Forest Walk, by the way, from the other Urnum. And he's attacking with both. I'm blocking a Lanawer. That means one of his Lanawers dies, but he does deal 5 damage to me. So I'm now on 16. But now I can attack with the Lord of Atlantis. I was kind of expecting him to play another creature here, here since he attacked with uh, with both of his Elves. But he chose to go full for the damage. Now I can attack with both. I believe I'm going to deal 6 damage. He's going to go down to 3. Exactly 3 life. It's looking really good for me. And he's not finding an answer. Showing what he has in hand. A Mox that's not going to help him here. And I'm showing my Mahamoti that I couldn't play out. So that means it is 1-2 for the Merfolks. And uh, yeah, let's shuffle up and go to game number 4. Game number four, here we go. It's a one, two, so I'm in the lead. This feels good. Maybe I can actually win this one. I do feel I've been lucky, but you need a little bit of luck in Magic. Here we see Chet starting Savannah into his Savannah lines. I love that stuff, man. Savannah, Savannah lines, it makes sense. And then tapping two more. There's a Chaos Orb, haven't seen that yet. Attacking me, going to 18. I'm a little bit nervous here. Playing Phantasmal Terrain on his duel. I believe I'm changing it into a mountain because now I know he's playing with blue sources himself. Now let's see if he's going to use that orb. First he's going to attack. I'm going to go to 16. Looks like he's going to use the orb. He's going to flip. Ah, he's missing it, but I have to intervene here, Chet, because he broke his arm. There we see his army had to flip with his wrong hand. So I said, you know what? Let's count this flip. It's not fair. You have to flip with your left. But uh, maybe this is a fair warning to all old school players that um, <laughs> practice with both your arms because maybe you break your good arm. I, I don't know, but I was thinking about it. What are the odds? But still, you never know. I'm, I always flip with right. I'm right handed. So I wonder if I can flip as well with my left. Maybe I should give it a try. Let me know in the comments below if you're like if you can flip as good with both hands. Ooh, I'm passing turn here, not finding another land drop. So that flip of the Chaos Orb was a really good one. Losing that land, not finding any land. Ah, oh, man, should I have kept this opening hand then? Maybe I had two islands in my opener. Finding an island now, at least, playing a Lord of Atlantis. There is a quick swords to plowshare, so I'm going to go up to 16. At least that's one hit from the Savannah Alliance that I'm going to survive. And tapping four Armageddon. Oh man, this is brutal. This game is not going in my direction. Oh man. What I need now is at least top deck an island. Okay, that's something. Ancestral Recall, I need like some power or something. I need help. I can't do this alone. There's a Tundra. Probably gonna bring me on 12. Let's hope he doesn't have another lion. Right? I hope he doesn't have another lion. 
Right, chat? You don't have another lion. Just attack with a lion and pass turn. Or not, don't attack, just pass turn. It's fine. Oh, man. I wonder what he's thinking about. Maybe he has another lion in hand. Maybe he's thinking... I don't know. I wonder. I wonder what... I guess always attack first, right? Just deal the two. Put me on 12... And we'll take it from there. So it's not... Yeah, he's attacking me. I'm going to go to 12. Then he's casting Ancestral Recall. That's brutal. Oh, man. That's the card that I need, chat. Not you. At least finding another island. So two islands from the top. That's something. Can I cast... I cannot cast anything. Where are my Merfolk Assassins? They're two blue for a one-two. They would be great. I would trade that for Savannah Line any day of the week. There is another Savannah Line. Even more pressure from chat here. I keep finding islands, so that is at least a good thing. Tapping two here, playing a Dance of Many, making a copy of a Savannah Line. Now remember, with Dance of Many, I have to pay two blue during my upkeep, or else the Dance of Many is destroyed, and that means the token also is destroyed. Hopefully, I can now just uh, block and trade for one of the lions. Attack it with the bow. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Going to trade a token. And then I should put the Dance of Many away as well. And um, looks like I'm forgetting that. I don't think it's very relevant at the moment, though. I'm on 8, by the way. Another hit from the lions. So I'm slowly dying. Those Savannah lions are doing a great job. And now I'm kind of remembering. Or actually, chat reminded me that uh, the Dance of Many leaves play as soon as the token dies. And playing another Dance of Many, okay. So, I mean, I'm fine with that. I can just trade it for uh, for the Lions. Wow, he's got five mana now. If he's gonna cast a Sarah Angel, I'm in deep, deep uh, trouble. And there is a Cyblast, oh man. It's not as bad as a Sarah, but it's it's bad. And he's attacking and I'm on six. This just this whole game has kind of been against me. Tapping three here. Disrupting Scepter. Oh man. That is absolutely worthless in this scenario here. In this current board state. Disrupting Scepter. The idea, of course, why I'm playing with Disrupting Scepter, by the way, is that I can bounce a lot of, you know, I've got four boomerangs and I've got the time elementals. I can bounce his stuff and then force him to discard something. There's a Sarah Angel. Horrible. I need an island and a control magic and then I'm fine. I'm finding a Lord of Atlantis instead. I'm not fine. <laughs> and I think I'm point. I remember this. I'm pointing out I need one more land. Magic can be so frustrating. This is what I uh, what I said to Chad, I believe. And uh, all, all in good spirits, of course. Oh, wow. Kicking your opponent down oh, when he's already on the ground. Man, this is brutal. Playing a Brain Geyser. But I'm already dead anyway. There's no way for me to do anything against the Sarah Angel. So I'm going to block this event alliance. We're going to trade. I'm going to take four. That's it. That's it. And I'm showing him my hand. Look at that. Two control magic, oh, one control magic and a clone that would have been so useful, but no islands in sight though for me. So this is um, the other game. So that means we have a 2-2. Two -two. Wow, we're going to go to all deciding game, an all deciding game number five. Game number five. This is it. This is the moment, the all deciding game. Will it be Chet from the United States of America? Or will it be Timmy, the local hero from the Netherlands? I don't know. Does that make any sense? Anyway, I really want to win this one. I, I feel that my deck deserves a win here. Come on. Fish liver poison. Taking a mulligan. Great start. <laughs> Not so good. Oh, man. That's always the thing when you're playing that decisive game. You're like, oh, this has to be the right hand. I think I had, if I remembered correctly, I think I had like a one lander or something. Hopefully I can just, what you always hope for uh, when you play with blue power is that you can just draw seven and of course you got to put one on the bottom but that you find an ancestral recall in there because that, you know, can make it all good. But 
Looks like, okay, putting a card on the bottom and it's my go playing an island and pass turn here. Chad drawing his first one and deciding what to do here. Playing a tropical island. What we see, there's a Llanowar Elf. So that's a great start for Chad having some ramp and I don't want him to get to four mana too quick. Hey, finally we find a Merfolk Assassin. Yes, I don't think we've seen a Merfolk Assassin yet in this match. Anyway, it's a 1-2 from the dark, and you can tap it to destroy target creature with Island Walk. So I've got to find a way to give his creatures Island Walk, and I can kill them. There is a Mox Sapphire and a Plains. He's got four mana now. Just tapping for the one blue. Will we see a recall? Oh, wow, even more mana. Oh, man, this is bad news for me. And he's casting an Urnum Jin. Turn two. This is not cool, man, chat. This is not cool. Well, it's cool for you. It's showing how well your deck's working. Oh, Fish Liberal Oil. Oh, there goes the Urnum. This is what I want to do. Oh, man. Life can be so great. Okay, actually, I'm changing my mind. I'm saying, you know what? I don't have to destroy it straight away. I can just wait. And instead, I'm passing turn. So I'm not destroying it straight away. I think that this is a mistake, to be honest. Or is it? No, I don't. I don't think. I don't think it's fine. I think it's a good because I can do it instant speed anyway. So I think it's a right play because now if he attacks, if I would have destroyed the Urnum in my turn, he would have attacked me with the Lanorer and I would take an extra damage. Look at this. He's attacking with the Lanorer. Does it mean he's got like a giant growth or something? I th oh, I remember. I think he forgot that my creature was a one-two, and I said, "Do you want to take it back?" And Chat was like, "No, man, it's good." Um, so he just made a mistake. He thought he thought the Merfolk was a 1-1 instead of a 1-2. It's understandable because how often do you play against Merfolk Assassin? I mean, <laughs> you don't see it that often. And there is a Derelore finding the board. He is taking a damage for casting that Derelore because he's tapping his City of Brass to make that black mana. And I think that the, the, the Derelores are really a nice inclusion. Now, my uh, Merfolk Assassin still has Forest Walk, so I'm using it, and I'm casting a Time Elemental. So Time Elemental is an O2 from Legends, and for two blue and two, I can tap it, and I can return target permanent to its owner's hand. So it's pretty good, but the problem is it's really expensive, and you cannot use it to block, right? If I block or attack with it, it destroys itself when I get five damage. So I have to take four here from the Derelore, and we also see that Savannah Alliance. Is he gonna play even more? Ooh, Armageddon, no, not an Armageddon. I, I'm starting to see a pattern here. I think every time Chet casts an Armageddon, he, he wins the game. Oh, my deck needs counter spells. I've changed my mind here. Look at that time elemental. It's completely worthless now. It cannot attack, it cannot block, I cannot use it. This is the worst. This is the worst. It reminds me of that one time when I played with Timmy's Spellbook and I had a pirate ship out and my opponent plays a tsunami and it took me a moment to realize that after all my islands were already destroyed, my pirate ship sunk as well. That was so brutal. Anyway, Chad, it looks like you're really winning this one. Playing another Savannah Lines. I'm on four. I've got one island. I mean, and I'm not chum blocking with the assassin, by the way. Attacking with everything. That said, wow, Chet, congratulations, man. You brought a really nice deck to the table, and I'm showing you my hand. I only needed one more blue, by the way. I could have cast a Fish Liver Oil and at least destroyed the Darylor. And I think that's a time walk there, that proxy card. So one more blue would have at least given me a bit of a fighting chance. Didn't happen. Uh, I just want to thank you, Chet, for uh, playing this match with me. I had a lot of fun. It's, uh, it's always good to play against new players and try new formats. So this was the Paladin format. And if you like what you see, check the description below. There I have a link to their website. They have meetups every Tuesday and I believe everybody is free to join, right? So just build that deck and you can join them. They also have a great community on Facebook. They have a community on Discord and all, those, uh, all that information about their social media presence is also on their website. So check the description below. There you will find the link to the Northern Paladin 
website and uh, yeah, have a look at Paladin Magic. I, I think it's, it's really nice. It's really cool. They're really friendly guys. I've played against uh, some of the Paladins before. It's, it's always good. It's always fun and entertaining matches. Um, and I would like to thank you for uh, watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And I would like to ask you to like this video if you liked it, of course, but I assume if you're this far in the video that you've enjoyed the content so please hit that like button it really helps the channel grow what else you can do is leave a comment and share this video on your socials another thing that you can do is you can become a subscriber of the channel so if you're new welcome here on timmy talks click that subscribe button and help me grow and help me make content for you there's one other thing that you can do is uh, and that is become a patron of the channel and by becoming a patron you can sponsor me it already starts with one dollar a month and because of the patrons and channel members that I have, I'm able to keep this channel alive and going. So the more uh, ch channel members and patrons I have, the more content I can make and I can keep the channel going the way it is going. So have a look, please consider becoming a patron. You can click on the info card that's appearing right now. It's got some nice perks. Um, you know, your name will be in the end scroll. You can join the Timmy Discord. We also have events and tournaments every now and then. And of course you can join them. So a lot of good stuff. Check it out, have a look. Uh, if it's something for you, please consider joining and becoming a patron. For now, thank you very much for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And now let's go to the end scroll and take a look at the fantastic, the amazing, the wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Ik het dus vind het dus somber gezien.